no matter what people believe this is murder, I believe it's murder, which means we're never going to stop talking about it and we're never going to stop fighting against it. Gavin O'Blinis is a former CIA and FBI contract operator. Sound Investigations is one of these groups, kind of like James O'Keefe, where they go undercover and they've got the camera on and they're just really friendly and hyping them up and they're trying to get information out of them. And what ended up getting caught on hidden camera is quite shocking. Let's take a look. Battles. As long as the Bureau is able to progress far enough to be able to put pro-lifers in jail whenever they want. Yeah. You think that's on the agenda? We can, we can, you can kind of put anyone in jail if you know what to do. How? You set them up. Wow. <laughs> you create the situation to where they have no choice but to act on their impulse. And once they act on that impulse, then we call that entrapment. It's a fine line. Is, does the Bureau practice entrapment a lot? We get really close. Not officially? No. We get as close as we can. We get as close as we can to it without doing it. So they can entrap some of these pro-lifers into doing things that they Depending, don't do. Yeah. We call it a nudge. Wow. We call it a nudge. I, the arrogance just dripping off of this guy. Yeah, I mean, we can pretty much put anyone in jail anytime that we want to. We just need the right resources in the right situation. <laughs> this should be terrifying for anyone who's like just a citizen of the United States and knows that the intelligence agencies see themselves this way. He's talking very openly. You know, some might call it entrapment. Bruh. Yeah, that's because that's what it is, you know, but we, we don't go that far. We just nudge them. And he goes on to explain how they'll use like fake social media posts and bots and people who are at these different rallies and stuff to try it and, and whip people up into a, a fervor. And specifically this target on pro-lifers, we can put a pro-lifer in jail anytime we want. This is really concerning because we have seen several different legal cases over the past couple of years of people who were very peacefully protesting outside of abortion clinics, uh, people who, you know, were taken to a, a, a local court and it was just kind of dismissed. And then all of a sudden later, the FBI is like knocking on their doors with a bunch of agents and guns drawn and everything, just like dads, you know, who have adopted kids and are trying to stand up for life. So what's going on here? And why would the government be focused on prosecuting pro-lifers all the way to the point of trying to entrap them and saying we can put them in jail basically anytime we want to. Well, one of the reasons that they're going to focus so much on this is because we live in an increasingly hostile world to Christianity and the broader Christian worldview. We're not quite there yet. And especially if you live in the Bible Belt, you still feel pretty safe from those things. I'll make the case over and over and over again. We are post post Christian in America. We are pre pagan at best. That's the direction that we're moving. It's not not the end of the world if you're a Christian because Christianity has actually always thrived in pagan environments. And in kind of the Christian nation, we were able to rest on our laurels and feel like we had already accomplished everything when a lot of people were culturally Christian without actually putting their faith in Jesus and then seeking to follow him even at great cost to themselves. The government's focused on pro-lifers because you don't have to be a Christian to be pro-life. That's definitely true. However, the majority, vast, vast majority of Christians are pro-life because of what we believe Scripture reveals about human life, the sanctity of human life, and when human life begins, which is pretty explicit in Scripture that at the moment of conception, and even if you read Psalm and Jeremiah before conception, like God who sees the ends from the beginning already has value on that, that life that is soon to come forth. One of the reasons I think this is so key for them to focus on and say we can put pro-lifers in jail whenever we want is because just because of the very nature of the pro-life debate, this is something Christians cannot give up on. You know, Christians, they're going to have different views on taxes. It's just probably not the hill that they're going to die on. They're going to have different different ideas on blue laws, you know, and whether liquor should be sold on Sunday. Just not the hill they're probably going to die on. 65 million babies killed in utero over the last 50 years. That is a hill we're going to die on because pro-lifers believe this is actually murder and the majority of Christians are pro-life. 
And every once in a while, someone on the pro-choice side says the thing out loud. That happened just last week with Bill Maher, who left his audience stunned and in silence by saying the quiet part out loud in the abortion debate. Like, I can respect the, the absolutist position. I really can. I, I, I scold the left on when they say, oh, you know what? They just hate women, people who aren't pro-life, they, pro-choice. They, just, they don't hate women. They just made that up. They think it's murder. And it kind of is. I'm just okay with that. I am. I, I mean, there's 8 billion people in the world. I'm sorry. We won't miss you. That's my position on what? That's quite harsh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's nothing good about this clip, right? Like, Bruh. there's nothing good. The one part I do take some satisfaction in is Bill Maher's audience is trained. He is a pretty good comedian, and so it's obvious when the punchline happens. Just like his setup, 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 punchline. It's very, very obvious. His tone and timbre of voice, the way he moves his body. It's like, I'm delivering the punchline now, and his audience is typically so trained that whatever the punchline is, they know to laugh. And he hits his punchline, which is like, there's 8 billion people in the world. Oh, we're not going to miss you. And it's silence. There's 8 billion people in the world. We're not going to miss you. <laughs> Sad trombone. He immediately looks at his own audience. He goes, what? Like he's shocked that he just admitted that abortion is murder. And he's just okay with it. Now, I'm not going to spend time trying to like pick apart his argument from a logical position because it's just not a logical argument. The, the idea is, I guess, something like, uh, well, there's too many people, so 8 billion of us already, so you can have an abortion and it's not really that big of a deal. The problem with that argument is you could just say that about anybody. You could say it about a two-year-old or a 20-year-old or a 70-year-old. Like there's too many people. And so anyone who died, like, you know, you're one out of 8 billion. That, that's like 0. 0.00000 something of the population. So who cares really, you know? Well, if it's murder, a lot of people care. And it's why typically on the pro-choice side, they try not to admit that. They obfuscate even what they're talking about. They call it an embryo. They call it a zygote. They call it a fetus. All of those are words, most of them in Latin, that just mean a baby or a child. You know, um, we don't want to focus on this. And that is why pro-lifers, the majority of whom are Christian, um, cannot let this go. We will not stop doing this, which makes it the perfect thing to point to as the issue that we can arrest over or intimidate intimidate or entrap because no matter what people believe this is murder i believe it's murder which means we're never going to stop talking about it and we're never going to stop fighting against it and there's an interesting story in the old testament most of us know the story at, at least the end of it because it's daniel in the lion's den and we know the end of it because daniel gets thrown into the den full of hungry lions and then the angel of the lord comes in and shuts the mouths of the lions and it's, it's this amazing miraculous story a lot of people don't know how daniel ended up in the den in the first place. Let's look at that in Daniel chapter six. It says, Darius decided to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom stationed throughout the realm and over them, three administrators, including Daniel. So in other words, Daniel has this very high position in the kingdom. These satraps would be accountable to them so that the king would not be defrauded. Daniel distinguished himself above the other administrators because he had an extraordinary spirit. And so the king planned to set him over the whole realm. He was literally going to be second to the king. The administrators and satraps, therefore, kept trying to find a charge against Daniel regarding the kingdom, but they could find no charge of corruption for he was trustworthy and no negligence or corruption was found in him. And these men said, we will never find any charge against this Daniel unless we find something against him concerning the law of his God. So they got together and went to the king and said, may the king live forever. All the administrators of the kingdom, they have agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an edict that for 30 days, anyone who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den. Therefore, your majesty, establish the edict and sign the document so that as a law of the Medes and Persians, it is irrevocable and cannot be changed. And so King Darius signed the written edict. So what's going on here is Daniel has established himself far 
and away above everyone else. And everyone is jealous of him. They're trying to find a way to bring him down. They're trying literally to find a way to entrap him. And they are nudging, to use Gavin Oblenis' language, they're nudging the king towards the decision that will ultimately entrap Daniel. And what do they say? This guy is like just and righteous. He's not going to screw something up. And so let's get him on the one thing that's a non-negotiable for him. Let's get him on how he interacts with his God. What they knew is that every single day, Daniel would go to his window. He, he's in captivity. He'd go to his window. He'd open it up, face Jerusalem, and he would pray to God three times a day. He would do that every single day. And they knew he would not compromise. Even if this law went out, it would entrap him because there's no way he's going to stop. And that is exactly what ends up happening. When Daniel learned the document had been signed, he went into his house, the windows in its upstairs room opened towards Jerusalem, and three times a day, he got down and prayed and gave thanks to God, just as he had done before. And then these men went as a group and found Daniel petitioning and imploring God. So they approached the king and asked about his edict. Didn't you sign an edict that for 30 days, anyone who petitions, any God or man, will be thrown into the lion's den? And they, they let him know this is what Daniel is doing. This is how they trap him. They trap him on the thing they know he will not negotiate on. The one thing he will not walk away from, the one thing that matters too much to him, it is the hill he is officially willing to die on. And I think if we understand, just like Bill Maher, who's pro-choice, understands what abortion is, the murder of the most innocent people in our entire society, we have to be willing to die on that hill. And if enemies of that position know that, then they know that is the one area they have the best chance at trapping us in. So what do we do? We cannot walk away from this. We can't pretend like it doesn't matter. We can't stop speaking truth about it. So what do we do? Here's what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. He said, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor for all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on you while you're angry and do not give the devil a foothold. I love that. In your anger, do not sin. What I love is Paul does not say, don't be angry. There are some things we should be angry about. There is such a thing as righteous anger. And if millions of aborted babies are not worth righteous anger, I just don't know what is. So it doesn't say don't be angry. It does say in your anger, do not sin. Do not give in to provocation. Do not give in to nudges towards unrighteous behavior for a righteous cause. In your anger, do not sin. Stand firm, but stand firm in righteousness. Do not negotiate, but keep love in your heart. Jesus told his disciples, I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. It's so interesting. He says, in me, you will have peace. Right before he says, in this world, you will have trouble. Things are going to be messed up. Things are going to get messy. You will experience hardship and suffering and persecution and unrighteousness and a lack of justice, but you can have peace because Jesus has ultimately overcome the world. And as long as we know that, and we know ultimate justice will reign someday, then we can stand firm our convictions. We can even be angry and not move into sin. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you are subscribed so you can stay up to date with all new content. And if you want early access, exclusive content, and monthly live Q&As, make sure to check out patreon.com slash Clayton Tyler.